This is a Scream Queen production. Welcome to So Dead. I'm your host, Jen Carpenter. Happy True Crime Tuesday. Today's story (laughs) is something. Uh, I pride myself on knowing my local history, especially the weird shit. But this one, I, I just, I don't know how I didn't know about this. I don't know who forgot to tell me about this. And I have a feeling that many of you are going to be surprised by what I say next because it seems that this particular bit of history was lost to time somehow. I don't know how, but let's just, okay, today we're going to talk about the Lansing Fruit Wars. Yes, I said what I said. In the 1920s, two rival fruit companies in Lansing, owned by members of the Italian mafia on all sides, got into a turf war, and the end result was murder, bombings, hitmen, arson. Yes, in Lansing, where I live and sometimes forget to breathe. And the irony of how I stumbled upon this story. So, For reasons that I will get into later on, I have been having a bit of a rough time lately. I'm struggling with a bit of trauma and PTSD, and it's just kind of making me hate everything right now, if that makes sense. So as I was getting ready to sit down and start researching this week's episode, I decided that I hated the case that I had picked. It's an important case, and I will get to it someday, but not today. I just I just wasn't feeling it. So I got out this big long list that I have of story ideas and that list has enough content to last me a few more years at least. And I'm reading through the list and I hated all of those too. So I did something that I haven't done in a really long time and I just started scanning old newspapers for something good. Old newspapers are super dramatic, so I searched the term sensational murder. (laughs) And holy shit, did I find one. Not just a murder, though, a whole ass fruit war. The irony comes in the fact that one of these fruit stands involved in said war was in a building that is directly across the street from my shop. Today, we call it Saddleback Barbecue. So it took an act of violence at my shop in today's world for me to stumble upon this story of an act of violence right across the street nearly 100 years ago. All right, let's get into it. There is a lot to unpack here, but we're going to start with a bang, literally. August 3rd, 1925 was a Monday. The morning air was thick with humidity and the sun was already blazing when, shortly after 9 a.m., a handsome, middle-aged man with a thick Italian accent holding a literal smoking gun in his trembling hands approached an elevator operator at Lansing City Hall and asked for directions to the police station. Moments later, he was standing at the desk of one Lieutenant Fouts. The man tossed a 38 caliber revolver onto the lieutenant's desk and said, Here I am. Take me. And Lieutenant Fouts was like, uh, Sorry, who are you? The man gave his name as Frank DeRose. And if that name sounds familiar, it's because we've talked about the DeRoses before on the show, but I'm going to get into that later too. What we need to talk about presently is why someone would give a fake name when turning themselves into police. 
Aliases are for when you're trying to hide, silly goose. Uh, It doesn't matter what name you give them once you're already there, whether you're Joe Schmo or whatever your given name is. If you're there confessing to murder, they're going to keep you. And that is what this man was there to do. The man in question was 39-year-old Joe Frank Rossi, local fruit merchant. Rossi's Fruit Shop was located at 1147 South Washington Avenue in what we now know as Rio Town, in a building that now houses Saddleback Barbecue. The state journal that came out that evening flashed a ghastly photo on the cover. Two old-timey cars parked along a curb, and between them, a large body covered with a white sheet. Police and spectators, men, women, and children alike, crowded the edges of the frame trying to get one last look at Big John Chardulo, owner of Baldino and Chardulo, a fruit shop located at 621 East Michigan Avenue in downtown Lansing. But how did we get here? Fruit stand owners shooting each other dead in the street in Michigan's capital city? Why? Well, I'll tell you. Don't worry. But it is a long, complicated answer that begins with an owl's nest and a man by the name of Charles Spagnuolo, who liked Lansing so much, he brought his entire Italian hometown. That was hard to say. He brought his entire Italian hometown over here with him. Charles Spagnuolo was born in Italy on July 13th, 1888. Sometime after the turn of the century, he emigrated from the small village of Sant'Ippolito. If I'm saying that wrong, blame Google because I even looked up how to say it right, and that is how Google Translate told me to say it. Sant'Ippolito to the United States, and he found himself in Lansing, which was in the midst of the auto industry boom. So he wrote to friends and family back home and told them of the plentiful, good-paying jobs at Oldsmobile and Diamond Rio and Lansing Drop Forge, and his people responded en masse. Before long, there were more San Ippolito residents living in Lansing than in San Ippolito. I'm really regretting how many times I, I wrote the name of the city out because I know I'm saying it wrong and I just have to keep saying it. Uh, thus, Little Italy, as it was once known here in Lansing, was born. The St. Ippolito Imports opened businesses all over the city. The kind of standard setup was that they would rent or buy small two-story buildings. Then they would open a shop on the lower level and live up on the second level. These buildings are still all over Lansing, especially in, you know, Rio Town, Old Town, and Downtown. So they should be easy enough to picture if you're local here. Among those who settled in Lansing were Charles Spagnuolo's brothers, William and Joseph. Together, the three brothers founded two successful companies, the Michigan Fruit Company and the Michigan Beverage Company. The Michigan Fruit Company was founded in the early 1900s. I couldn't find an exact date, but it was located at 311 Larch Street in downtown Lansing, which, according to Google, is now the parking lot for the Outfield Apartments. If you're not familiar, the Outfield is a hideous from the outside, but probably really nice on the inside, apartment building that overlooks the Lansing Lugnuts Minor League Baseball Stadium. And look, I don't know what we're calling the park anymore. Uh, It was Oldsmobile Park, and then it was Cooley Law School Stadium. Now it's something else. I just call it the Lugnuts Stadium, okay? So that's what we're going to call it today. Anyway, so this apartment building literally is in the outfield. Like instead of a home run wall, there's an apartment complex. And again, if you super love baseball and you want the view out your back window to be a minor league baseball field, cool. This is the place for you. I'm sure the apartments are very, very nice on the inside, but the exterior of that fucking building and the others like it around town, hideous. Just It's just not for me. Super bright colors, really bulky and weird looking, but it's fine. And it doesn't matter because our story isn't set in the 2020s. It's set in the 1920s when the outfield didn't exist. And the Michigan Fruit Company, mid-Michigan's largest wholesale fruit distributor, was in its place. The Michigan Beverage Company, which the Spagnuolo brothers also started in the early 1900s, was located downtown as well at 111 East Shiawassee, which is now part of Lansing Community College's campus. From what I was able to tell, it's kind of like a 
garden slash patch of grass between the arts and sciences and Gannon buildings. There's a Cata bus stop there and an LCC sign and nary a reminder of what was very nearly the worst loss of life disaster in Lansing's history. The Michigan Beverage Company bottled and distributed soda pop and other beverages. The Spagnuolo brothers weren't just building businesses, though. They also built an owl's nest. The Order of Owls is a secret fraternal order that was founded in South Bend, Indiana in 1904. Its purpose was to assist each other in business, to help each other in obtaining employment, to assist the widows and orphans of our brothers, and to give aid to our brother in any way that they may need and assemble for mutual pleasure and entertainment. Lansing's prominent Italian businessmen wanted in on that shit, so they formed their own nest, and that's literally what they called them. They were not chapters, they were nests. Why? I do not know. I don't make this stuff up. I just tell you about it. So while the Spagnuolo brothers were instrumental in building this nest and they did hold titles within the organization, the president was a man by the name of Giovanni Big John Chardulo, who owned a fruit shop at 621 East Michigan Avenue downtown, a building that has been occupied by many shady characters over the years, even in recent years, I've heard. The shop was called Baldino and Chardulo, and while most of them in Michigan got their wholesale fruit from the Michigan Fruit Company, Chardulo got his fruit from the National Fruit Company, which was basically on the same property as the Michigan Fruit Company. The National Fruit Company was located at 513 East Michigan Avenue, where the Lansing Lugnut Stadium stands today. So National Fruit was the ballpark and Michigan Fruit was the outfield. Ready for it to get more confusing? While the Michigan Fruit Company was owned by the Spagnuolo family, the National Fruit Company was owned by the Spaniolo family, also Italian immigrants, just so we're clear, and also officers within the Order of Owls. And, in case you were wondering, Michigan Fruit and National Fruit were not besties. They were fierce competitors. Despite this, according to an article in the State Journal, Lansing's Little Italy was peaceful and prosperous until the Rossi brothers came to town. Now that part turned out to be a complete fucking lie, but let's put a pin in that for a while so that we can talk about the Rossis. Quick disclaimer, I did my very best to find all of the information I could on the Rossi brothers. The problem is they both went by a shit ton of aliases, so old newspaper articles on them were pretty hard to dig up, J. Frank Rossi and his brother Harry were, from what I could find, only about a year apart in age. They were both born in Italy around 1886-1887, and they immigrated to the U.S. as adults. They were both married. Each had four kids. Harry Rossi was a salesman for the Michigan Fruit Company, and Frank Rossi owned a fruit stand that was supplied by Michigan Fruit Company. His shop, as previously stated, was located at 1147 South Washington, where Saddleback Barbecue is now. One thing I read hinted that Frank had like an actual stake in the Michigan Fruit Company, not that he just bought his fruit from them, but I'm not sure in what capacity or how involved he was. So we've got the National Fruit Company and the Michigan Fruit Company, rival fruit wholesalers next door to one another. One supplies Big John Chardulo with fruit. The other supplies Frank Rossi with fruit. Sworn enemies, right? So when their feuding fruit suppliers decided that Lansing wasn't big enough for the both of them, what choice did these men have other than to fight to the death? On July 3rd, 1925, Frank Rossi was visited by his cousin from Jackson, Frank Penn, which sounds like a fake name to me, but okay. Penn had a warning for his cousin with the same name. He had been approached by a man who'd been approached by a man who'd been approached by Big John Chardulo and Vincent Spaniolo, the owner of the National Fruit Company. Big John and Mr. Spaniolo offered to pay $1,000 to have four of their Michigan Fruit Company rivals killed. Brothers Joseph and Charles Spagnolo that owned the company and brothers Frank and Harry Rossi that worked for the company. 
Their goal was to cripple operations and so terrify the remaining members of the Michigan Fruit Company that they would just pack up and leave town. So the man that Big John and Vincent Spaniolo went to was Dominic Turry of Muskegon. They were like, hey, we've got $1,000, which would be a little over sixteen k in today's money. We need you to find someone to kill four people for us. So Dominic Turi contacted his old buddy, Pazzy Rocco of Kalamazoo. Can I just say real quick how much I fucking love these names? Because I love these names. He asked him if he wanted the job. But Pazzy wasn't just any old hitman. He took his time, did his research. He wanted to know more about the men that he was maybe going to kill, but he didn't know anybody in Lansing. So he reached out to a friend that had ties in Lansing to ask about the marked men. That friend was Frank Penn of Jackson. When Pazzy told Frank Penn the names of the men he'd been asked to kill, Penn was like, Bitch what? Those are my cousins. So Pazzy Rocco and Frank Penn told Dominic Turry that they would take the job. He gave them $500 as a down payment and told them to do it on the 4th of July so that the sound of fireworks would drown out the gunfire. So Pazzy and Frank Penn headed to Lansing on July 3rd, and they went directly to Frank Rossi's fruit shop, which again is directly across the street from where my bookshop is today. They told him about the plot to kill him, his brother, and the Spagnulos. They flashed him that $500 down payment as proof, and then they booked it out of town with their murder money. The Rossi's and the Spagnulos ramped up their security, and they became hypervigilant. But no one was more on edge than Frank Rossi. Those who knew him said he looked visibly ill, pale, nervous. He looked like a ghost, probably because he knew he was about to become one. Not at all helpful was the fact that Big John Chardulo and his car full of goons would just sit outside Frank Rossi's fruit stand for hours watching him. Now, the reason that Frank Rossi was so terrified was that he knew Big John's threats were not empty. It hadn't been too terribly long since Frank's cousin, William Rossi, had been taken for a ride, as they say. Literally, they said this. This was a term that was used in these newspapers, taken for a ride. His body was found floating in the Grand River, a bullet in his brain. The murder was never solved, but it was rumored around town that Big John was behind it. So he knew that Big John meant business. So when Big John called Frank Rossi on the morning of August 3rd, 1925, and asked him to come down to his shop so they could talk, It's understandable that Frank took a gun with him. When Frank arrived at the Baldino and Chardulo fruit stand, which was only about a mile from his own fruit stand, Big John suggested that they take a ride, which was code for, let's drive down a secluded road so nobody hears the sound of me shooting you in the head. To keep up pleasantries, the official request was for Frank to join Big John at the Connor Ice Cream Company picnic at a lake south of town. But Frank knew that as soon as there were no witnesses, Big John was probably going to kill him. So why did he get in Big John's car with him? Who knows, but he did. They didn't even make it a mile. Frank noticed instantly that Big John set out driving north instead of south, which was the direction of the party they were supposed to be going to. But it was hard for Frank to concentrate on where they were going because he was preoccupied by the things Big John was saying. He kept telling Frank things like, you look like a dead man. You should be a dead man. Big John pulled into the Cadillac garage on the 100 block of West Ionia Street, less than a half mile from his fruit stand, and he called for oil and water. He looked at Frank before he got out of the car and he said, you stink like a dead man. Then he got out of the car, walked around to the front, and popped the hood. From where Frank was seated in the passenger seat, he saw Big John reach into his pocket and he did not hesitate. He pulled a 38 caliber revolver from his own pocket and he fired six times. Four of those bullets hit Big John and he collapsed dead on the street. As a crowd gathered and authorities converged on the scene, Frank Rossi ran in the opposite direction to the police station a block away. So here are a few facts that I just, I don't really know how to weave them into the story skillfully, so I'm just going to tell them to you. A, Big John did not have a gun in his pocket when he was killed, so whatever he was reaching for, it wasn't a gun. 
He did have a gun in the pocket of his car, though, as it was explained in the article, whatever that is. Uh, A witness who worked at the Cadillac garage testified that she, too, saw Big John reach into his pocket right before Frank Rossi shot him. But he didn't have a gun in that pocket. So he did reach in the pocket. He didn't have a gun. Number two. Less than two weeks before Big John Chardulo was murdered, the owner of the restaurant next door to his fruit stand was also murdered. 45-year-old Arthur Rogers was a jack-of-all-trades, contractor, husband, father of 10. He once operated a saloon at 623 East Michigan Avenue, which, ironically, today is home to Capital City Homebrew Supply. When Prohibition came to town in 1918, the saloon magically became a restaurant slash general store, and Rogers took on a partner, Bert Gilbert. By 1925, Bert Gilbert was serving time at Jackson Prison for violating state liquor laws. Imagine that. And Arthur was trying but failing to run the restaurant with Bert's wife, May, in Bert's absence. So during one particularly nasty quarrel, Albert quite literally tossed May out of the restaurant onto the street, and then he drove to Jackson, found Bert where he was working on a road gang, and told him about his wife's behavior. So it was, things were not, not good. Just before midnight on Tuesday, July 21st, 1925, shots rang out from inside Arthur's store, right as he was getting ready to close for the night. A police officer who was patrolling the neighborhood heard the shots, four in total, and raced to the restaurant just in time to see three men jump into a covered Hudson and speed off. Inside the restaurant, the officer found Arthur dead on the floor, his face, head, and neck riddled with bullets. May Gilbert was tracked down in Detroit, but she had a solid alibi, so she was released as a suspect. And apparently the Lansing Police Department had never heard of hiring someone to kill someone for you. Of course, she didn't do it. The police officer saw three men running away from the scene. That doesn't mean she didn't hire them. Anyway, the murder of Arthur Rogers was never solved. And 12 days later, the fruit guy from next door was dead as well. Number C. Remember, we were numbering those here, and then I got way off track telling you a story. When Frank Rossi turned himself in for the murder of Big John Chardulo, he gave his name as Frank D. Rose. This is interesting for a couple of reasons. One, because there was a Frank D. Rose in Lansing, and he was also an Italian immigrant with a fruit stand. Two, both Frank Rossi and his brother Harry often used the last name D. Rose as an alias. And three... We have talked about the DeRoses before. Last summer, the Grand Ledge Slayer episode, number 71, The Salesman. If you don't remember it or you haven't heard it, go listen to that when you're done listening to this one. Don't stop in the middle. That would be kind of weird. Write it down. Make a note in your phone. Richard Hare, the Grand Ledge Slayer himself, was the son-in-law of a man who went by two names, Paul Amedio and Harry DeRose. Harry DeRose was a Lansing business owner. He owned many of the buildings on Michigan Avenue, which in the 60s, when he owned them, this was known as Lansing's Sin Block. It was full of adult clubs and bookstores and gay clubs and things of that nature. The Sin Block of the 60s was located exactly where the National Fruit Company, the Michigan Fruit Company, Big John's Fruit Stand, and Arthur Rogers' Restaurant were located in the 1920s. So let's math this real quick. Betty Reynolds, the victim of the Grand Ledge Slayer, was killed in 1966 when Richard Hare was 25. That means he was born right around 1941. If we assume that his father-in-law was roughly 30 years older than him, then that puts Harry DeRose as being born maybe around like 1910-ish. So he would have just been a kid, maybe a teenager when the fruit wars were going on. Why am I telling you all of this? Because if you remember, Richard Hare claimed that his father-in-law, Harry DeRose, was deep in with La Cosa Nostra, said he had married into the family and basically become their errand boy. He even claimed to know what really happened to Jimmy Hoffa. And at the time, I called bullshit. But now, I kind of believe him. And let me tell you why. When Frank Rossi was charged with first-degree murder, he hired three attorneys. Two were local, 
Ernest Smith, and Frank L. Dodge. Frank L. Dodge of the Turner Dodges, resident of the Turner Dodge Mansion, and father of garbage human Franklin Dodge Jr. During Lansing's Fruit Wars, Franklin Dodge Jr. was a dry agent for the FBI, meaning that he enforced liquor laws during Prohibition, and he was in the middle of his own great scandal at the time. The very same year that Daddy Dodge took on the Frank Rossi case, Dodge Jr. was in a cell with bootleg king George Remus. He was undercover as an inmate, supposed to be gathering information to use against Remus for, you know, legal purposes, but instead he used the information to steal George Remus' wife and his fortune. This all ended in the death of Remus's unfaithful wife, Imogene, and Franklin Dodge Jr. wound up in federal prison. Now, this isn't necessarily connected in any way to the Fruit Wars, but I just think it's important to keep highlighting what wild country Lansing was in the 1920s, because it was wild. George Remus was an Italian, he was German, but as the biggest bootlegger in the country during Prohibition, he did have ties to all of the Italian gangs and mafias. And so did Lansing, because let's be real here, none of this, <laughs> none of this was about fruit. This was not some cute little small town rivalry between fruit stand owners like the State Journal wanted us to believe. This was the Italian mafia in Lansing. And if it wasn't clear before, it certainly became clear when Frank Rossi brought in his third lawyer, Louis Colombo of Detroit. Louis Colombo was the attorney for Santo Peroni, a vicious leader of Detroit's Italian mafia who helped Jimmy Hoffa get his start. So there is a tie between Richard Hare, the Grand Ledge Slayer, and Jimmy fucking Hoffa. Hare married into the DeRose family, who used the same mob lawyer as gangster Santo Peroni, who worked with Jimmy Hoffa. Does that mean that Richard Hare knows where the body's buried? Of course not, but I do believe his story a little bit more now. It's got a little bit more meat to it. Still not convinced of this whole Italian mafia in Lansing thing? Here are some other ties that don't really fit neatly into the story anywhere, so I'm just going to list them out for you. The Spagnulos, the Spaniolos, the Chardulos, the Rossis, they were kind of like the founding fathers of the Italian-American community in Lansing, right? The godfathers, if you will. They started a chapter of the Order of Owls, which I already talked about, but they also started the San Ippolito Society. There's that word again. They named it after their little hometown in Italy as a way to celebrate and honor their heritage. The San Ippolito Festival that they started is still a thing today even. So let me tell you about some of the other founding members of this organization. Emil DeMarco, owner of Emil's Restaurant. Yes, the Amos restaurant that we have talked about at length on this show. It's a pretty well-known fact that Italian mobster Al Capone spent time in the Lansing area, and when he was here, his favorite place to eat was Amos. He even had his own table, and if he walked in the door and someone was sitting there, sorry, gotta go, it's Al Capone. What are you gonna do, tell him no? Also, on the second floor of the Michigan Beverage Company, which the Spagnuolo brothers owned, was the Dreamland Dance Hall, operated by George and Lulu Parrish. George and Lulu also oversaw the Dreamland Orchestra, which supplied the music at the dance hall. Want to know where else the Dreamland Orchestra played regularly? At the Pine Lake Casino on Lake Lansing, where mob boss Mickey Cohen was a regular, and the Round Lake Resort in Langsburg, where Al Capone spent his summers and had his own summer house. Need more? Okay. Another member of this particular owl's nest was Frank Cascarelli. The Cascarelli family owned a fruit stand in Hillsdale, a small town about 70 miles south of Lansing near the Michigan-Ohio border. A fruit stand that in 1923 was bombed, allegedly by the Black Hand Gang or La Mano Nera, La Mano Nera was a faction of the Italian mafia that extorted money from business owners through the threat of violence. They would send out letters offering protection, often stamped with like a black hand or a hand holding a dagger that basically said, hey, you're going to pay us X amount of dollars to protect your business. 
it's dangerous out here in these streets and you don't want something terrible to happen. And then if the business refused this generous offer of protection, something terrible would happen. A beat down, a fire, a bombing, something. Word on the street was that Pete Cascarelli, the well-respected owner of Cascarelli Fruit Store in downtown Hillsdale, was visited by a member of La Mano Nera just days before his shop exploded. Pete refused their services and a few days later awoke to the walls of his home and business, because he lived up on the second floor, um, crumbling around him. He told police that he had no idea who could possibly want to hurt him. He had no enemies. He denied having been visited by La Mano Nera, and he just had no idea what could have happened, which, like, I don't blame him. He survived the bombing. He doesn't want to turn on them now, you know? The bombing of the Cascarelli fruit store did not result in any casualties or even injuries, but a significant amount of property damage was done to the downtown area. And while we're on the topic of La Mano Nera, here in Lansing, they ran the streets in the early 1900s. And they didn't just target businesses, they targeted individual people, like forced poor factory workers and laborers to give over a portion of their paychecks to avoid being savagely beaten. And they made gruesome examples of those who resisted. One of the leaders of Lansing's Black Hand Grift was Sam Bruno, who lived in the apartment above 1224 Turner Street in Lansing's Old Town. Would you be surprised if I told you that in 1913, 1224 Turner was a fucking fruit stand? Because (laughs) it absolutely was. And ironically, today, it is a well-known barbecue (laughs) restaurant called Meat. Uh, I don't know why this is so funny to me, but it is. Because if you're from Lansing, you know that Meat and Saddleback are kind of the two big name barbecue joints in town. So I just find it super weird that during the Fruit Wars, they were both fruit stands owned by the Italian mafia with murderous mobsters living on the second floor. And now they're both super popular barbecue restaurants. Anyway, let's move on. So in the early 1900s, Sam Bruno was arrested over and over and over for assault, extortion, threats. I think a total of six members of the Black Hand Gang in Lansing were arrested in the apartment on Turner Street, the 1224 above Meat. One State Journal article I found even referred to them as the Turner Street Gang. Sam Bruno escaped police custody at one point, and then he was missing for like a year. And yes, They were all part of the local Italian mafia. It was a whole ass mess. It dominated the headlines. And yet 12 years later, when the fruit wars popped off, the police and media wanted to sit over here singing, we don't talk about Bruno and act like this was the first time they had ever had trouble with gangster fruit. It wasn't the first time. And honey, it was nowhere near the last. Okay, so back to 1925. 39-year-old J. Frank Rossi was on trial for first-degree murder in the death of 36-year-old Giovanni Big John Chardulo. The prosecution was up against some pretty stiff competition. Local attorneys Ernest Smith and Frank L. Dodge of Turner Dodge Infamy, as well as big-time Italian mafia defender Louis Colombo. Not to mention all of the people that knew that Big John was trying to have Frank Rossi killed. After just a two-hour deliberation, a jury acquitted Frank Rossi of all charges, and he walked out of the courtroom a free man, arm-in-arm with his wife, who had been running their fruit shop in his absence. And if the story ended here, it would be a fascinating story, right? But the murder of Big John Chardulo was not the end of Lansing's Fruit Wars. It was just the beginning. Around 5 a.m. on the morning of Sunday, March 27th, 1927, a set of explosions rocked downtown Lansing. Buried in rubble and engulfed in flames was the Michigan Beverage Company, owned by the Spagnuolo Brothers, located at 111 East Shiawassee and what is now part of Lansing Community College's campus. Just five minutes before the blast, Lansing police officer Ed Moulter had been at the front entrance of the building trying to open the door. Why? I'm not really sure. There was nobody inside. The 200 or so people who had been partying at Dreamland Dance Hall on the building's second floor had all gone home a couple hours earlier, and it was far too late, or maybe too early, depending on how you want to look at it, 
for anyone to be at work at the bottling facility. Maybe, maybe just like wanted to make sure there was nobody there, that there was no shady business going on at the dance hall. At any rate, he was very lucky that he walked away when he did, because within minutes, glass and debris from the building were scattered over an entire city block. There were two explosions just moments apart. The blasts were so strong that windows shattered in all of the surrounding buildings for over a mile. One official called it, I am, I am not kidding you, this is literally what, is, <laughs> what it said in the paper. It was the largest glass catastrophe which has ever occurred in Lansing. <laughs> largest glass catastrophe. Property damage topped $1 million and the entire downtown area looked like a war zone. Rumors began circulating pretty quickly that the building had been bombed, just another victim of the fruit wars, but police pointed out that there were a jillion other things that could have happened besides a bombing. The gas boiler in the basement could have exploded, the drums of carbonic acid used in the beverage making process could have exploded, the delivery trucks filled with fuel at the back of the building could have spontaneously combusted. Sure, if the building had been leveled a few hours earlier with over 200 people on the second floor, it would have become the worst loss of life disaster in Lansing history and one of the worst in state history. But that didn't happen. Nobody died. So once the initial shock and public interest died down, crews quickly cleaned up the wreckage, insurance companies quietly paid out settlements, and everyone moved on. But not for long, because this was the Lansing Fruit Wars. Less than a year later, in the early morning hours of January 31st, 1928, a small explosion shook the ground at the Spagnuolo Brothers Michigan Fruit Company at 311 North Larch Street, where you will now find the parking lot for the outfield apartments. But it wasn't meant to be a small explosion, and it wasn't meant for the ground. At 1.30 a.m., an occupant of a passing vehicle tossed a nitroglycerin bomb at one of the building's windows. But that car might should have slowed down just a wee bit more because the bomb didn't break the window and land inside the building as it intended. Instead, it hit a wall near the window and it landed on the ground, kind of bounced, rolled, and exploded in an open field. So it did nothing more than burrow a hole into the ground, shatter a few windows, and damage a woodshed. What's really scary about this one, though, is that the Spagnuolo family home was located on the same property as the fruit company. So this was very personal. Officers found three Italian out-of-towners parked at the National Grocery Company just around the corner at, you know, 2 o'clock in the morning after a bombing, so they took them into custody. The men, all from Jackson were James Dijoni, I'm sure I said that wrong, Carl Magnata, and Frank Scarpino. Circumstantial evidence, shoe prints and tire prints, and their close proximity to the scene was what was used to charge the men with the bombing. Now, it was not lost on authorities that this was the second explosion at a Spagnuolo Brothers property in less than a year. So now that first explosion at the Michigan Beverage Company was important. But who was behind these bombings, and why? After taking statements from the three Jackson men, another arrest was made. Are you ready for it? You're not ready for it. Fucking Frank Rossi, slayer of Big John Chardulo, was accused of being behind the whole thing. So... I am not really sure what we missed here, but we missed something because in 1925, when it was revealed that the National Fruit Company was trying to extinguish the Michigan Fruit Company, the Rossies and the Spagnulos were on the same side. Frank Rossi was portrayed in the newspapers as mild-mannered, fearful, remorseful. He only killed Big John because he had to. One thing I did leave out, I think, which comes to mind only now, is that the Rossi brothers were, like, super handsome for the the time, both of them. Frank had, he was allowed to have a local barber come into the jail every single day while he was being held to get a clean shave and a haircut. Every day. The police department converted a detective's office into a makeshift barbershop for this man. 
He was described as cheerful and kind, soft-spoken, very affectionate with his wife and children. And now, less than three years later, he's the fucking mastermind behind multiple bombings of the homes and businesses of his friends and business partners. Frank Rossi and his three accomplices were all represented by the same legal team. Harry Hiddle, who was the prosecutor in Frank Rossi's murder trial, and good old Frank Dodge again, even though he'd had to sue Frank Rossi to get his attorney fees the first time around. All four men were found guilty on conspiracy charges on March 7th, 1928, and they were all sentenced to 10 to 25 years in prison. Three months later, the Lansing home of Frank Rossi's brother Harry exploded in the middle of the night. Harry Rossi, his wife, and their children lived at 1020 West Saginaw Street. At roughly 4 a.m. on Sunday, June 17, 1927, the Lansing Fire Department was alerted that the Rossi home was engulfed in flames after a loud explosion was felt and heard by neighbors. Thankfully, question mark, you'll understand the question mark in a little bit, no one was home at the time. The State Journal article about the fire said that Rossi's wife had not lived in the home since Thursday, which makes me think that maybe she left him. But if she was just like away on a trip or something, that would be an odd phrase to use, that she had not lived at the home since Thursday. But it was the 1920s. They talked weird. Who knows? Harry claimed to have been out of town when the house exploded, and officers did find him in Augusta, a small town near Kalamazoo, the day of the blast. I mean, blowing up his house because his wife left him does sound like something Harry would do, and you'll find out why I say that here shortly. But no determination was ever made as to who or what caused the explosion, simply that it was intentional. The loss of the Rossi home and the extensive damage to the surrounding homes was simply chalked up as another casualty of the fruit wars. Okay. Ready for things to get weird? I mean, they're already pretty weird, but they're about to get real weird. On July 31st, 1929, Frank Rossi's wife of 18 years, Catherine, filed for divorce and full custody of the children. I mean, her husband was going to be in prison for the next 10 to 25 years. Well, Frank's brother, Harry, did not take that news well, and a couple weeks later, on August 17th, he attempted to kill Catherine Rossi. Whether or not he acted upon his brother's request was unclear, but Catherine was shot in the neck. She was taken to Sparrow Hospital, where she was reported to be in good condition within just a couple of days. After the shooting, Catherine Rossi withdrew her divorce petition, and Harry Rossi disappeared. The Lansing Police Department distributed his picture to police departments around the state, but they didn't have a whole lot of hope of finding an Italian mobster with 27 different names who didn't want to be found. Harry Rossi worked his way down to the Detroit area, started using his brother's name as an alias, like a psychopath. Why would you use the name of someone who is currently in prison for terrorism and has been all over the news as your alias? Dumb. But he also used the name Frank Messina. As Frank Messina, he was arrested in 1930 on suspicion of a murder in New York City, but that charge was later dropped. Word on the street was that Harry Rossi had gotten himself in too deep with the wrong people and he'd gotten a bit too big for his britches. So it wasn't much of a surprise when the following was published in the Detroit Free Press on September 15th, 1931, just over two years after Harry fled Lansing following the attempted murder of his brother's wife. Harry Rossi, rum runner, hoodlum, and racketeer, went for his last ride Monday, and it ended on King Road near Trenton, where police found him after a three-year search by Lansing authorities. There were two bullets in his brain. It was a two-year search by Lansing authorities, but potatoes, potatoes. The article went on to say, Police believe Rossi was killed by members of a Lansing fruit racketeering ring. A Lansing fruit racketeering ring. And here's something interesting. Probably not at all connected, but interesting nonetheless. When Harry Rossi was murdered in 1931, he was living as Frank Messina, and his registered address was 1540 St. Aubin Street in Detroit. St. 
Aubin Street, as in the St. Aubin Street Massacre. This is a story that I've had on my list for forever, so a full episode is coming on this. Um, So I'm just going to kind of gloss over it today. But on July 3rd, 1929, the month before Harry lost his shit and tried to murder his sister-in-law, an entire family was slaughtered in their St. Aubin Street home less than a mile from where Harry was living in Detroit under an assumed name. Benny Evangeliste, the patriarch of the murdered family, was into some real weird, culty, religious shit, but he was also an Italian immigrant living in a city where the Italian mafia was strong. From what I've read, it sounds like Harry was just kind of here, there, and everywhere after he blew up his house in Lansing in 1928. So who knows how long he actually lived in the house on St. Aubin Street. He could have been living there when the family was murdered. I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. I just thought that was super interesting. In 1934, six years after his conviction for the bombing of the Michigan Fruit Company, Frank Rossi, who at some point dropped the E from his last name and was now just legally Frank Ross, was paroled from Jackson Prison. He did not return home to his wife. He didn't call her. He didn't check on the kids. He just disappeared. And so on Valentine's Day, 1935, Catherine Ross filed for divorce again on the grounds of non-support and desertion. Now, I have no idea what Frank Ross did upon his release, if he returned to the Lansing area or if he went somewhere else. And as far as I could find, the Lansing Fruit Wars simply fizzled out after that. A couple of like retrospective state journal articles laid the blame for the Fruit Wars primarily at the feet of the Rossi brothers. But how accurate that is, I really have no idea. What I am sure of, though, is that the city was real quick, real quick, to sweep this ugly bit of history under the rug because I had never heard of it, any of it, ever in my entire life. And the only information I could find on it was from newspapers from the very early 1900s. So I don't think it's been talked about like in any sort of published work since it happened, which is wild to me. And that's it. That's all of it. Well, I'm sure that's not all of it. Um, That's just the parts that made the newspaper the Lansing Fruit Wars. Fucking wild. Thank you for coming to my dead talk. My sources today were a shit ton of old newspapers and then one single solitary write-up about the Cascarelli fruit store bombing from the Hillsdale Historical Society. And now I'm going to tell you how I came across this story and why, and this is also today's liquid cheese. If you follow me on TikTok or follow the Dead Time Stories page on Facebook or if you know me in real life, then you already know this or at least some of it. A couple of weeks ago, we celebrated our one-year anniversary in Rio Town at Dead Time Stories. And we have an anniversary. Our anniversary is from our actual open date when we started as kind of a pop-up. That's in October. So I didn't want to call this our anniversary. We did something a little different. I kind of held an award ceremony for different books, different categories, you know, best title, things like that. And it was, yeah, it was a big party. We had like snacks and specials and all that stuff. And it was a really great day. We were super busy. Lots of people came just to say hi. And, you know, they'd come maybe to the opening, but hadn't been back since. And it was, it was a great day until the very end. Um, I'm going to try to get through this without crying. I'll do my best here. So about 530, um, and it just, it happened so quick. The store was full of people. There were people checking out. I was talking with them. There were several people on the Dead Time Story side, a few people over on the Screamatorium side. And the first thing I heard was a woman say, oh, here he comes, Debbie. And something in her voice was like it set off my alarm bells. And so I kind of paused what I was doing. And no sooner did she say that, Then I heard a man screaming outside. And before I even could really register what was going on, he was inside the store. And he was very clearly um, struggling with his mental health. And um, he 
just started saying very loudly some very inappropriate things. So um, I walked around. I, I ho- My hope was that he, you know, would kind of see that this was not a place he wanted to hang out and turn around and walk back out, but that didn't happen. So I kind of walked over to him and like as politely as I could, I said, sir, I'm going to have to ask you to leave. And he just started screaming. Um, He started calling me names. He started asking me if I thought I was tough. And then he reached his hand into his waistband and said, look, I'll pull this out. I'll get rid of all y'all. Look. And I had to stand. I I didn't know what to do. <laughs> I didn't know what to do. So I just stood there waiting to see if this man really had a gun. And the way that he said, look, he said it a couple times. He really thought he was going to pull something out to show me. At least that, that was what it felt like. Um, so I just stood there. I mean, everybody froze. I've watched the surveillance video back several times. Everybody just kind of froze in place. And he did not pull out a gun. If he had it, I didn't see it. Uh, He just kind of started to back out the door, um, still saying really mean things. And as he was backing out the door, he kind of made finger guns at everyone. Um, And then once he was out, I went back up to the register. I was like in shock. It took a couple seconds to process what was happening. And I'm really disappointed in myself for that because I watch true crime and listen to true crime constantly. Like, I should have known how to handle that situation. I should have known what to do. I just walked back to the register and checked my customers out and tried to make a joke about, like, true crime in a true crime store. Um, And then I realized that this man had just walked out of my door and was headed towards all of these other businesses full of people. And what if he really does have a gun? So delayed response, maybe like 30 seconds, a minute after he was out of the store, I called 911 and uh, they asked me which way he had gone. So I had to go out and look and he was like a block down the street and I could still hear him yelling. And he was very near to a building that was full of people because there was a music, music event going on. And he started to walk across the street. And as I'm talking to her and kind of explaining what he looks like and what happened and, you know, she's sending the police, um, he walks out into the middle of the street and just kind of like he put his arms out and then just stood there stopping traffic in both directions. And then he would start walking back towards me and then he would turn around and go back towards, you know, these other businesses that were full of people And I'm just sitting there like, please hurry, please hurry, please hurry. All of the customers, you know, scattered from my store. I feel really, really bad. So if you, I know that some of the people that were there with me when that happened, listened to the podcast. So I'm so sorry that that happened, that that shouldn't have been your experience. And I'm really sorry. And I feel really bad about it. So I go back inside, I lock the door and there's so much to do, right? I need to try to notify these other shop owners that this has happened and that they could be in danger. I need to call my husband. Um, My parents live very close, so I actually called them first. Um, And then I called my husband. And, of course, you know, once you're on the phone with, like, your mom or your spouse, you start crying, right? So I did. Uh, Police came, took my statement. And here's something that I found super interesting. I was trying because I knew they were going to ask me what he looked like, what he was wearing, all of that. So I was trying to memorize all of that as it was happening, and then I was also trying to make sure I had it right when I was waiting for the police officer to get there, which they brought, like, 12 cop cars. Like, they were not playing around with this situation at all. They It was was a big deal. So the officer is asking me questions about what the guy looked like and what he was wearing, and the only thing I was sure of, I was so sure, positive, was that he was wearing a light-colored jean jacket. I said that to him several times. And then it clicked, wait a minute, I've got this all on surveillance video. And so, unfortunately, the way he came in and the way he stood, there was never a good shot of his face. He even, like, backed out of the store. So, the you know, had he turned around and walked out the door, there would have been at least a little bit of a glimpse of his face, but he backed out. So 
yeah, we pull up the the camera and we're looking at it, trying to get a look at his face. He was not wearing a light jean jacket. <laughs> he was wearing like a dark blue, almost nylon-y jacket. And that was just wild to me because I was so sure. I was so sure that it was a jean jacket and it wasn't. And it had just happened. So you think about like all the cases where people are questioned like days or weeks or months later. I couldn't even get it right minutes later. So yeah, that kind of changed my perspective on the whole people giving inconsistent statements thing because now I've fucking done it my own self. So they found the guy, they stopped him. The officer told me that they were going to check him for warrants and they were going to check him for weapons. But if he didn't actually have a gun on him, then him making that threat was not a crime. I have no idea how the whole thing ended. They they didn't come back and update me. So I don't know if he had a weapon on him. I don't know if he had warrants. I don't know if they took him to jail or just let him go. But I have not been handling the situation very well. I went like several days where I just didn't sleep at all. I couldn't sleep. Um, I couldn't really function. I couldn't. I was doing the bare minimum, like getting the bare minimum done. Meanwhile, new podcast episode date is bearing down on me. I already had my story picked out. I've had it picked out for a couple of months. And I do change them from time to time when something comes up that I maybe hadn't thought about or didn't know about. But this one I'd had picked for a while just wasn't feeling it. I just haven't been feeling anything really lately. Still, still. And it's been a couple weeks now. So that's why I went to the newspaper archives looking for something new. And I want... (laughs) And I want to read you the headlines. So this was the first article I found about all of this, all of the fruit wars and everything we've talked about today. The first article said, fruit merchant shoots rival in street. And I was like, excuse me, what? Warring fruit merchants? I thought this was going to be like this simple, almost kind of funny, old timey, true crime story. I was not expecting at all any of this. Like, none of it. But I am so glad that I found it because if ever there was a piece of Lansing history that needs to be retold, it's the Fruit Wars. So a new true crime story time is coming your way next Tuesday and then a new full-length So Dead episode the week after that. If you don't already, go follow me on TikTok at ScreamQueen517. Um upcoming events at Dead Time Stories. Oh yeah, yes, there are a couple. So this Friday, April 15th, is our Titanic Panic event. It is the anniversary of Titanic sinking, so we're doing a whole Titanic-themed deal with merch and uh, gifts and treats and books. And the Kona ice truck is coming from two to four, and they're going to be serving edible icebergs. Just... Their standard delicious shaved ice in a million flavors, but I, I'm calling them edible icebergs because I'm very extra, and we all know this. April 23rd, the Girl Scouts will be back selling cookies. I think we're going to do like 12.30 to 3.30 maybe, so if you need Girl Scout cookies, season's almost over. Stop by and get some from these adorable little girls. They were just there this past weekend, and they were so much fun. April 24th is my birthday. We're not doing anything fun or special at the store this year like we did last year. But if you want to stop in and say hi, like that'd be cool. And then April 30th, which is a Saturday, is Independent Bookstore Day. There are currently 10 independent bookstores in Lansing, 10 of them. And I i don't mean the Lansing area. I mean within the city of Lansing, 10. When I opened a year ago, there were three. I think that that is so amazing. And Independent Bookstore Day is the perfect time to come out and celebrate with all of us. Lansing's Bookshop Row is still kicking. There are five of us right on Washington Avenue. So it's Dead Time Stories, The Robin Books, Wayfaring Booksellers, Summit Comics, and A Novel Concept, all within about a mile of each other. Um, And I'm pretty sure that everyone, all of the Lansing bookstores, have some fun stuff going on for Indie Bookstore Day. At Dead Time Stories, we'll be doing free used kids' books, Cat and Kitten Adoptions with Saved by Zaid, Blind Dates with a Book, which 
We've got a version of that now that is used books, but we're going to do a little bit of a fancier version. And then we're going to do some fun kind of throwback merchant accessories. So think like Riff and Book It, stuff like that. So April 15th and April 30th, Titanic Panic, Independent Bookstore Day. I will see you at Dead Time Stories. Until then, keep shining, you magnificent what the fucks. <laughs>